Last week, how many of you were here to hear Pastor Mike Lane from Greenhouse Tampa do an excellent job walking through navigating justice? It's God's burden, it's God's vision, it's God's heart. We are not simply responding to the world around us but we are reacting, but we are responding to the God within us. If you missed it, check it out on our YouTube or podcast. This week, I wanna dive into the parish, like the existential question, why am I here? What is this whole thing called life all about and what happens when it's over? This week, I wanna talk about navigating the afterlife. Everybody say, wow. Stand to your feet with me as we read and honor God's word together over there in Guyana. What's up to y'all? Love y'all online. We're gonna be in two passages, John chapter three, 1 Corinthians nine, and then we will bounce about the scriptures And uh, Tanner, I'll forgive you for the Steelers jersey as long as you don't wear it next week when the Dolphins play you. I still love you though. Tua apparently is getting healthier. Please, Lord, have mercy on the Dolphins fans. You've seen our suffering for so many years. Okay, we'll read the Bible now. This is John 3, 16 for all you Sunday school kids. Say it if you know it. For God so loved the world that he... Beautiful, that... You have a cheat sheet, right? (laughs) Not perish, but have eternal life. What does that mean? That's a good question. We'll get into that. This is 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Paul is writing, he says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? I told y'all participation trophies were not biblical. We got proof right here, all right? I'm just saying, only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should inherit eternal life. What's that? Run in such a way so that at the very end you can get the prize. What's that? I'm glad you asked. Let's pray. Jesus, help us out. Amen. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five, an elbow bump. Hey, I'm happy to see you if you're married to him. Smooch him on the lips, on the cheek. You do your thing, I'm just trying to help you out. Somebody said, aw. You ever had a difficult time understanding the purpose behind something? Anybody ever had a challenging time? Like, why are we doing this? Any of the why people there, you're like, we've got a why person in the last household. His name is Liam and he's six. Sometimes it feels like he's six going on 36 because this kid asks all the questions. And oftentimes, frustratingly so to his parents, they are very good, logical questions. We decided, now this is not no shade, right? This is a last family decision, but we decided due to the proclivity of our child to be hyper inquisitive, that we would not try to put the wool over his eyes in relation to, uh, are there, if there are kids here, cover their ears, uh, Santa or the tooth fairy, right? We're just, we're just gonna shoot straight with Liam because he's gonna figure it out regardless. And so we were like, hey bud. And uh, a few weeks ago, he lost his first tooth. It's like this momentous occasion for parents. We're like, oh my God, my kid's getting older. You know, it's terrifying and amazing all at once. And, um, and so we're like, wow. And so, you know, we kind of told him we had been talking for a few days because it was loose leading up to it about teeth and the tooth fairy. And well, it's actually a tooth fairy. Surprise, it's mom and dad, you know, and spoiler alert. And he was like, okay. And so we talked about all this. And um, so he was, he was sort of processing this reality, moving into things. And then he lost his tooth. And so he was like, hey, so I get like something under my pillow, right? And we're like, well, yeah, we'll still, you know, sure, I guess so, why not? We'll still do the pillow thing. And so we were at dinner and he uttered the words that, that regularly evoke fear and trembling in the last household. He said, you know, mom and dad, I've been thinking. He said, you know, since, since in our family, we told him, we're like, listen, don't tell like other kids the tooth fairy is not real. Well, like, like, don't be that kid, right? Some of y'all were that kid growing up. Don't be that kid. He's like, you know, so in our family, since we don't believe in the tooth fairy, and it's really just mom and dad, um, when you put something under my pillow, can you just put toys under my pillow? He said, I don't want money. Mom and dad, I have too much money. He said, no adult ever, right? He's like, I just have too much. This is a true story. He said, I have too much money. He said, listen, I have all these gift cards. It, just, it was just his birthday. So he's like, I got an Amazon gift card. I got a Target gift card. I got another Amazon gift card. He's like, I don't need any more money, mom and dad. I just, can you just put toys under my pillow? So I was like, 
I mean, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so we got him a little, like, a uh, Power Ranger thing. I'm like, it might poke him in the ear, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Put it under the kid's pillow. And I was like, well, Liam, since you don't, since the gift cards are basically meaningless, you want to give me all the gift cards? He's like, yeah, my Target spending spree <laughs> for my wife, right? But I feel like when it comes to the afterlife, we kind of feel about life and the afterlife like Liam about gift cards and money. He doesn't really actually understand the correlation. The causation hasn't connected yet. And he's like, I got all these like little plasticky things and I got all these paper things. I don't want any of this. I want toys. And I think when it comes to life, we're like, man, I got, what is this life all about? I mean, you're here for a little bit and you have some good moments and you have a lot of bad moments. And, and then like, what's the point? Like, why am I here? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? Does it matter? For humans, whether they're religious humans, non-religious humans, spiritual humans, agnostic humans, we find ourselves trying to navigate this complexity of life, theology, religion, eternity. Why are we here? Does it matter? And if so, how? And then the follow-up question is, if, if we're struggling just to figure out this earthbound stuff, what happens when this is all over, what happens when we cross over to the other side? Is it, is it eternal nothingness? Like we're, we're here and then poof, we're gone? Like is that, is that it? Is, I mean, can you say this word in church? Is it H-E double hockey sticks? Hell, like is hell real? Like what is, I thought Jesus was loving, what is the Bible? Is hell really a thing? Would God really do that? And, and, and if hell exists, like is it really that bad? And, and heaven, like, is, is, if heaven exists, is it really that good? We, we have all sorts of interesting ideals in our modern world about heaven. I did a quick Google search and I'm like, what is heaven like? Here are some of the images when we in our modern context, especially North Americans and Europeans think about heaven. Here is heaven, according to Renaissance painters. Here is heaven, according to a more modern rendition. Here is heaven, according to precious moments. Now keep that up. I don't know about the rest of y'all. I'm like, this does not seem like heaven to me. This seems like my version of hell. Like hanging around with a bunch of chubby babies that are not mine on clouds. I'm like, shoot me in the head and send me to I don't know where because I'm in heaven already. Like what in the world? Paul says, run in such a way that you might get the prize. Is that the prize? Oh my goodness. That is definitely not of the Lord. I can guarantee you that because we know where dogs go, but nobody says that about cats. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Lisa's like, I have a special one that I did some good research on about what angels actually look like. I'm like, yeah, you can put whatever you want. That's what she put. But I'm like, if this is the prize, right, think about it. All the carnage, all the hardships, all the suffering, all the challenges, like run in such a way that you can win the prize. If this is the prize, man, let me tap out a long time ago. Cause that just seems horrible. What is heaven? What is the afterlife? Like, what are we actually doing? And I think if we're not careful, we actually don't even pause to ask the question. We just kind of go through life because life is crazy and life is busy with this vague idea and notion that I, I guess I'll just go to, uh, yeah, everybody wants to go to heaven. Well, do we? Is it that? Is this the prize? What happens after we die and how is it supposed to inform our lives now? Ready to go? I wanna unpack this together. To, to, to sort of get to where we end, we actually have to start where we began. Here's my first point of three. We were created for relationship. Turn to your neighbor and say, relationship. We were created for relationship. This goes all the way back to the very beginning. In the beginning, before there was people, it was just God. It was just God. That's the only way I can make my voice sound deep and really tough. Otherwise, I sound like Mickey Mouse. In the beginning, Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God himself is in community. 
God in his very nature is in community. This is the beginnings of where we get this theological idea of the Trinity. Well, while it's not explicitly said and in forms of that word, the Trinity, this idea of God being in community in relationship with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's picked up again in John 1. In the beginning was Jesus, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and God's Spirit hovers over the deep. God himself is in community, and we are made in God's image, which means we were made for community. God, yeah, the God of community. Nancy's always like, why do you tell people to answer questions and you have an answer in your head and then everyone feels bad? I'm sorry, Nancy, you're always right. <laughs> Genesis 2, God says, he kept, he, he's making things, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, and then he says one thing is not good. Here's what he says. It is not good, what? For man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. He says, it's not, human beings do not thrive in isolation. In fact, we wither. He says, it's not good for man, for humans to be alone. And this reality has continued ever since. I went on a heartbreaking research journey this week on what is being called the loneliness epidemic. Social scientists and researchers are trying to grapple with this fact that we are the most connected interconnected seemingly generation that has ever existed in relation to the internet and social media, and yet we are increasingly lonelier than ever. One article in Harvard Magazine says, social psychologists define loneliness as the gap between the social connections you would like to have and those you actually have. A national 2019 survey led by the health insurer Cigna found that 61% of Americans report feeling lonely, with 22% of adults saying they often or always feel lonely or socially isolated. Over the past 30 years, researchers discovered the number of people Americans called confidants, check this, fell by almost one third. And specifically, men's average number of friends dropped by 44%. Now, it's not just a guy problem. They said the same study found that 25% of all Americans hadn't talked to anyone about something deeply important to them in six months. This epidemic of loneliness, as you can imagine, has only grown and been exacerbated by the pandemic. And it's hitting everybody across all age demographics, but it is especially destroying and targeting adolescents and young adults. According to the studies, 18 to 24 year olds are now the loneliest group in the country. And our youth are only getting lonelier. A study published in July of 2021 found that twice as many adolescents experience loneliness today as they did 10 years ago. That's a doubling of loneliness in a decade. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, listen, you know, I was raised in a tough love environment. You know, people feel lonely. People have always felt lonely. Like, is loneliness really such a big deal? Well, actually, empirically and biologically, it is. The health implications of loneliness have become clearer over time, according to the research of Julianne Lundstedt, a professor of psychology and neuroscience at BYU, the heightened risk of mortality from loneliness, check this, equals that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being an alcoholic. And it exceeds the health risks associated with obesity. Literally, biologically, we were created for relationships. There's something in us that's hardwired into us that's longing for relationships. There's a reason that we search for relationships to fulfill us, to, to make us whole, to make us feel complete, to help find meeting. It's because it's actually part of our design. We're gonna move from this in a moment, but I need to let you know and remind you, I know we all kinda know this, but we don't do it all the time. You need people in your life. You need deep relationships. You need life-giving depth of community where people can encourage you when you're down and actually know what it looks like when you're down and challenge you when you're all up in your high and mighty self thinking you got it all together and you need to be brought down to earth a little bit. You need community. We've designed environments right here at Greenhouse. They're called microchurches. It's a bunch of people getting together to, to provide a space for deep, life-giving, retethering, soul-stirring community. And if you haven't checked one out yet, you're missing out, I'm telling you. My wife and I have led one and been in one for our whole marriage, beyond. 
And every single time, it's always inconvenient. We're busy people. You're going, you're moving. Every time we get done, and we're like, oh, this is so worth it. Why? Because we're made for relationship. You need people, but people alone won't cut it. It's, it's one of the key ingredients in the recipe God has concocted for humans to thrive and flourish. But people alone won't cut it. Why? Because people are flawed. People are humans. People will drop the ball. People will have the best intentions and let you down. You need people, but people alone won't cut it. This craving for relationship is pointing to something, which brings us to point number two. You were created for relationship with God. You were created for relationship with God. If we take it back to the garden, we're in Genesis chapter two and chapter three, and God says, he makes Adam, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. He creates Eve. And then we see this very interesting picture of what God intends for humanity, for this creation that he made. God is there, and in Genesis two, God starts making animals. And if you've read the story, it's, it's, it's kind of a trip. God starts making stuff, and then he brings it over to Adam. And, and he's like, hey, Adam, why don't you name this? I mean, if you stop for a second, it's like, God, you, you made it. Like, you ever had someone at work, like, start a project and then just throw it in your lap and be like, all right, man, go figure this out. You're like, what are you doing? You started the thing, finish it. God starts naming, an, God starts creating, he creates all these animals and he brings it to Adam. Why? Because God, God made him not just to be, he made him for relationship. He wants to collaborate. He wants connection. And so he brings, I imagine this picture as Adam's just sitting there and he's like, oh man, God, look at this one. It's so cute, and fluffy and amazing. I'm gonna call that a dog. Everyone's gonna love this one, God. This one's amazing. And the little one's gonna be called a puppy. And then God brings another one over and he's like, man, this one's kind of, God, are you messing around with me on this one? This looks like a beaver married a duck. What is this thing, God? And God's over there laughing. He's like, ah, is this a prank, God? He's like, I'm gonna call this one a platypus. This one's crazy. You know, and he brings another one over, and Adam's like, ooh, God, I don't know if anybody's going to like this thing. God's like, oh, come on. He's like, fine, I'll give it a shot. Come here. And it starts going, he's like, oh, I think it likes me, and then it bites him. And he's like, God. He's like, I'm going to call that a cat. No one's going to want that. That's for you, Lisa. I just picked, there's this interesting back and forth where God creates Adam. Some of y'all are like, why did you do that? I don't know. I don't know why I do half the stuff I do. But God makes Adam, and, and they're in this relationship. It's, it's genuine, it's real, it's intimate, it's beautiful. They're naming stuff together. They're doing stuff together. It says that Adam and Eve would take these evening strolls with God through the garden. They're hanging out. Because that was always God's intention for humanity. We were created for not servitude. We were created for relationship with God. And then sin comes into the picture. This lack of trust in God's goodness and his plan and the fact that he has our best intentions in mind. And when sin comes in, this relationship is fractured with one another and with God. And since the very beginning, God's plan has always been to bring us back into relationship. It's echoed throughout the trajectory of scripture. Look at it in 1 Timothy. It says, for there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. In 2 Corinthians, it picks up the same refrain. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Do you notice a word popping up that might be important here? Reconciliation, reconciling. God's heart from the very beginning, he made you and he made me and he desired a relationship and sin fractures that relationship. And since the very beginning, God is working in his redemptive plan to bring us back into what? Relationship, to reconcile what was broken. His plan ever since Genesis has been the same, all about restoring and reconciling relationship. So like in the garden, we can be with him forever. Now the question is, do we really want that? Show of hands, how many of you are like, I would like to go to heaven when I die? Show of hands. Okay, good. I'm with a bunch of sane people. You could put them down. I, I think if you poll any rational human being, they would most likely say, and maybe not everybody, but most people would probably say, yeah, I, I think I would like to go to heaven when I die. Why? Because they're like, well, I guess the alternative would be to not go to heaven, which is hell. And that doesn't sound very fun. I don't think I want that, so I guess I'll take option B if those are my choices. 
And it really does beg the question, and I feel like I would be mistaken to go through navigating the afterlife and not reference, if the Bible is our heavenly GPS, like what does the Bible actually say about hell? Like there's this God, I know the Old Testament, and, but then Jesus, he was, all, he was a love guy, so he did, did he talk about it? I don't, what does the Bible, our heavenly GPS that sets our framework for identifying life and reality, what does the Bible say about hell? It's actually quite interesting. There was one individual in the Bible who spoke about hell more than anybody else. Can you guess who did that? Jesus, Jesus. In fact, Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. He doesn't only reference it, he describes it in great detail. He says it's a place of eternal torment, unquenchable fire where people gnash their teeth in anguish and regret from which there's no return, even to warn loved ones. He calls it a place of outer darkness, compared it to Gehenna, which was a trash dump outside the walls of Jerusalem where rubbish was burned and maggots abounded. Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven, and he describes it more vividly. Why? Because he loves us, and he doesn't want us to go there. <laughs> We get so interesting in our duplicitous thinking and very unexamined philosophy and theology when it comes to eternity. If there was a pothole that I saw my little boy running towards and I said, Liam, watch out. And you came to me and you said, how dare you make loud, how dare you yell at your son? Pastor John, do you know? And you started going on this diatribe. All I would have to say is pothole. And you'd be like, oh my bad. Because you would realize if there's a real danger, real love precipitates a real response. Namely, you warn about the realities. Jesus cannot be all loving if he is not honest and truthful of what the Bible says is a real possibility for human beings in eternity separated from God and hell. Now back to the question, I mentioned how many of us want to go to heaven and we raised our hand and we said, okay, yes, that, that sounds really good. And, and, and if my follow-up question is why, some of us might say, well, I, you know, the alternative sounds kind of horrible, you know, in terms of hell, I don't want to go there. But, but, but what else is the reality that the scripture talks about? Hebrews 9.27 tells us that it is appointed for a man to die once and then comes judgment. If you're asking, what does the Bible say about the afterlife? In the scriptures, we don't see purgatory in the Bible. We don't see reincarnation in the Bible. The, the example and the model we're given in the scriptures is we have one life and we have one chance and we have one opportunity and you need to maximize it because that is your one moment, which we won't and we can't, which is why we need grace, amen? But that's the paradigm of scripture. We were created for relationship with God. And lastly, number three, we were created for relationship. We were created for relationship with God. And point number three, relationship with God starts ahora, ahorita, en este momento. That's all I got. We were created for relationship with God and it starts now. John 3, 16, we'll bring it back. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have awesome was that what's that it's a big deal to God apparently because he sent his son Jesus to make it happen and yet I, I think I've got it what 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 is it what is eternal life is, is it heaven is it the little chubby cherubs like what, what are we talking about here what is eternal life to go back to my question that I asked, how many of us wanna to go to heaven? Everybody raises our hand, and I think we, we do in a general sense, but oftentimes the answer when we ask why is, well, I don't wanna to go to hell, but, but I think if we're being truly circumspect in a general sense in the culture in mass, often though the response is, well, I, I, I like the idea of paradise. This is throughout the religious landscape in Islam, this idea of paradise is a place of comfort and luxury. It's literally called gardens of pleasure. It is about sensual uh, bliss, uh, whether that's sexual or otherwise. All of the senses are experiencing all of the things. You are in your personal paradise. In Buddhism, it's about you reaching a place of utter enlightenment. In Mormonism, it's about you kind of leveling up until you can get some sort of a god or deified status, and maybe you could get a planet of your own. There's all of these ideas, but at the end of the day, almost every religion is looking for a place of pleasure and paradise that's all about 
you. This is huge. You have arrived. You have made it. And now you will be served for all of eternity. No more dishes. A little taste of hell on earth. Although my wife did them this weekend. I just want to give her glory and honor. Thank you, Nancy. Man, heaven is going to be that place I've been longing for where all of my wildest dreams come to place. Heaven, well, I, I, I wouldn't actually say it like this, but heaven is, it's all about, it's all about me. So how does Jesus describe eternal life? Thankfully, Jesus didn't leave it as a theoretical concept and principle. He actually described it explicitly later in the text. Jesus said in John 17, 3, right, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In John 17, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, read it with me, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Track with me. Jesus says, listen, God loves you all so much that he gave his son, me, that whoever perishes won't have to die, but experience eternal life. You're like, yes! And then Jesus is like, and let me tell you what it is. And they're like, waiting on the edge of your seat. Like, I'm trying to wakeboard and then go underwater. They're like, what is it? What is eternal life? I'm getting trauma coming back right now. What is eternal life? Okay, ready? You get to be with me. Okay. Forever! That's it. You get to be with him forever. And I think if we're truly being honest, this is where we, we don't examine our thinking because if we didn't really enjoy being with him on earth, I'm not sure how much we're gonna enjoy being with him forever. We get so crazy about this. How could a loving God send people to, to, to hell? How could a loving God send people to eternal separation? It's like, if you spent your life actively avoiding someone, what makes you think you would suddenly want to spend all of eternity with said someone? That's not called heaven's friend, that's called kidnapping. That's called hell. C.S. Lewis is so helpful in the doctrine and theology of hell. He said, listen, God will, God will send anyone to heaven that wants to be there. We just read it. God so loved the world. You read the trajectory of scripture. God wants, he's longing for, man. I, God, it says in Ezekiel, I don't take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. I want them to turn. I want them to come back. I want them to come home. God's heart for Adam and Eve expanded out to all of humanity is always the same. C.S. Lewis said, nobody ends up an eternal separation or God called hell that doesn't want to be there. Hell is a place where people who have said their entire lives, God, not your will, but my will be done. God finally gives them ultimately what they've been asking for all along. And some of us aren't in that boat. Maybe that philosophically helps you grapple with this idea of how could a good loving God, the good loving God is not forcing himself on people to accost them and kidnap them for eternity. The good loving God is saying, listen, if you stiff arm me away for your entire life, I'm not gonna force you to be with me forever. But I wish you'd turn. I wish you'd change your mind. Let me expand it in a earth analogy. Because most of us are, are probably not in that boat. Most, I mean, all of us in the room raised our hand. I want to go to heaven. And I think most of us are like, yeah, God seems, yeah, it seems like a, a good, you know, re eternal retirement plan to me. And, and I think if we're not careful, heaven will look a lot like this. Hannah? Hey. Oh, my gosh. What's going on? Hi, so nice Michael, right? You. Yeah. What the heck am I? That was... Just like a gut response, I'm sorry. It's nice to meet you. Wow, you look just like your pictures. That's awesome. So you ready to go to the water? Yeah, let's All go. All right, cool. So like, do you have any like siblings? I, I never asked you that, I don't think. I have a sister. I bet, I bet she's not as pretty as you. She's probably way uglier than you. Or, <laughs> I, you're probably the pretty sister. You're, 
This would be a nice setting for like a like a romance movie or something. I I watch I watch tons of romance movies. I love romance movies, TV shows. What are some of your favorite romance shows? Oh, like just like the really sweet ones, like Love Island. Uh, uh. What? Too soon. Nah, I was just so I'm so tired. Ah, work, work, work. That's all I do. You have a lot of gum in your mouth. It gets smaller the more you chew it. You truly are one of like the most beautiful girls I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh well, thank you. Oh nope. I I'm gonna call it a night. Actually. Are you sure? Anybody ever been on a cringy first date? Show of hands. A little bit of corporate therapy here. Cringy first date. No sparks. No chemistry, right? That takes time. You're just like, I want, even watching this right now, some of you went to like PTSD mode. I'm sorry, your, your therapist will thank me for the bill, but like, you're like, oh my goodness, it's so bad. Like cringy, awkward first dates, it's so bad. And, and I wonder if that's gonna be the experience of a lot of people in heaven. There's this guy in, in, in the sky that, Loved you a lot, apparently. And every now and then you would talk a little bit to him here and there, and now you're stuck with him for eternity. And I wonder if we're not careful if heaven will end up feeling like a cringy, awkward first date that lasts for eternity. And I wonder if we pause for a moment and thought a little bit more circumspectly about what the whole point of this life is if we realize that that this thing called eternal life, which is, which is knowing God, it actually is supposed to start right now. And it doesn't have to be this cringy, awkward, and obviously I'm using hyperbole, right? We're gonna get to heaven, and even if you're like, man, I made Lynn by the grace of God and the skin of my teeth, and I wish I would have ne not neglected relationship, but you're there, you're gonna be like, wow, he's so good, he's so amazing, it's gonna be incredible, right? But, but imagine if what heaven felt like was a long-awaited reunion with a close friend. Track with me on the emotions there. I'm trying to help us think human here. God's a little bit different. The, the analogy doesn't totally hold, but you know, over the pandemic, all we had with people was screens, relatives, maybe a best friend. And for a year, for maybe two years, you, you, you did these Zoom calls and, and you're like, man, and, and there was lockdowns and you couldn't go. And then you finally get reunited and you run up to that friend, you give him a big hug or of whatever you do. And you're like, oh my, and, and you remember those feelings? You're like, man, I, I don't wanna be anywhere else in the world. I'm so happy to be back with you. Cause we've just been looking at each other through this screen kind of dimly in a mirror, but now we're face to face. This is so good. I could do this for forever. That's heaven. That's Jesus' depiction of heaven. And I love this community because you guys really care about God. And every time we talk about something, I have conversations afterwards over and over where we're processing these things together. And, and if you're here and you're starting to have the wheels turn and realize, I, I think heaven would feel more like a cringy first date than a long-awaited reunion with a deep, close friend. You're still breathing. You have time to build a relationship. Because that's what it is. Eternal life real life. It's relationship with God. And for those of us who had had encounters, for those of us who have had moments, we've, we've been here on a Sunday morning, right? And Zach and Kayla are doing their thing and your windshield washer in it to your, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden, man, God shows up and his presence does something in your heart. And you're like, I don't even know this song or like this song, but I'm crying and, and your feelings and all, and you're like, man, that was so good. That was just a glimpse. You're there at your home on a Tuesday morning and you're spending time abiding with Jesus in his word and something that you've read 50 times before jumps off the page like it's alive and your heart gets softened and you hear God's voice and you're like, oh my goodness, I could be here forever. Or you go to a breakthrough weekend, which by the way, if you're looking for a weekend and encounter with God that's gonna deepen and accelerate hot, amazing relationship, that is what it's for. And you're at breakthrough weekend and you watch God move in your life and someone else's life. You're like, oh my goodness, this could last forever, you start getting a glimpse of, wow, 
heaven sounds like heaven. (laughs) Eternal life is to know God. And that's supposed to be heaven. The biblical version of heaven and the afterlife is not a self-centered reality where you find your long-awaited paradise for all your hard work on earth. It's not about your treasures. It's not about your mansions. The scripture tells us at the end of it, we're gonna see Jesus and we're gonna be so excited, we're gonna take all that stuff and throw it at his feet anyways. We could care less about it because we get him. He's the prize, he's the treasure, he's the delight of our hearts and we get there and we're like, Jesus, it's you. We don't really have anything because we're there in heaven. You know, you don't bring your car with you or whatever. She's like, well, here's, I got some stuff here. We just give it to him out of joy because he's so good. And he's the desire of our hearts. And eternal life is to know God, which means it starts right now, I remember losing my dad and all that, the carnage that that entailed right into a, had a baby, then right into a pandemic, and I'm, I'm reeling, trying to catch my breath, and, and then God just, just stepped in. I mean, as real as anything I've ever experienced in my life, and, and just becomes dad. And just steps in. I'm, 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 ta- I'm thinking to myself, and God just interrupts my self thought. It's like, hey, son, and, and and this idea of a philosophical deity all of all of a sudden becomes that was real to a degree. Becomes so deeply real in the midst of personal pain and suffering, which, by the way, is when it often happens. And I remember moments where I'm like, man, I, I would not ever want to go through a season with this amount of pain ever again, and I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because God was so near, because he's been so near, because he continues to be so near. Friends, you were created for relationship with God. The deepening longings of your heart will not be found in relationship with people. You need people, but they're gonna be found in relationship with God. All the things you've been looking for, they're all found in him. He's the loving father you've been craving and seeking your whole life. He's the wonderful counselor that you can pour out your heart to. He's the prince of peace you've been trying so desperately to find. He is the lover of your soul. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm not saying that you don't need people in these areas of your life to step in, but if it is only people, it'll never last. You were created for relationship with God. It starts now. And listen, I know I made some bold statements and I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk. We all find ourselves in that boat. But I want us to think deeply about what we often unexamine. What is eternity and what is heaven? It's what we're supposed to be starting right now. It's deep relationship with God. Here's the application point. This week, I wanna encourage you to take inventory of your personal relationship with God. And I'm talking an honest assessment, not the right church answer, not the I learned this in Sunday school. Like, pause for a moment, take some time of self-reflection, invite God in and say, God, where, where are we really at? Maybe you'd be brave enough to say, I actually don't have any sort of real relationship with God. I have no idea what he sounds like. I have no clue what he likes or dislikes. I have no clue, but I'd like one. I'd like to have a relationship with God. Here's the great news. You, you can do that. That can start today. God is inviting. He loves us so much. He's made all of the advances. He's done all of the pursuing. He's done all of the heavy lifting to make that a possibility. And if you realize that I've heard of God, maybe, I've been, maybe you've been religious and in church your entire life, and you're like, yeah, I've heard of him, but we're, I mean, we're, we're distant acquaintances at best. There's an invitation to deep, real relationship with God through Jesus, eternal life, which starts now, knowing God. Maybe you've got a relationship, but if you're being honest and circumspect, it's a shallow one. Deep relationship with God is spelled like deep relationship, all deep relationships we have in life. It's spelled with four letters, T-I-M-E, time. For those of y'all that were not tracking with that spelling, time. That's how you have deep relationships. My relationship with God is so shallow, I don't know what to do. Spend more time with him. 
That's not all that it is, but that's a lot of where it starts. Right, it's, it's a commitment or maybe a recommitment to abiding in Jesus. Maybe at one point, if you think back when your relationship with God was thriving, you were like, man, I would just lose track of time with God. I'd be in my Bible, I'd miss my favorite TV show, i miss my favorite sports game, I miss, I would miss, a point. I mean, I was just with God, I miss hanging out with friends, you still made it to work, okay, amen, be faithful where you're at. But you're like, I, was just, I just got lost in my time with God. And then somebody came in and said, man, are you really, are, are you really that legalistic? Are you real? And they made you feel small because you spent big time with God. Maybe it's time to go back and do the things you used to do when your heart was beating full of love for Jesus. Because that's where deep relationship is birthed and born. Set yourself up for the joy of heaven, a reunion with a beloved friend that you've been seeing dimly, but now you get to see face to face. Maybe you've got a growing relationship and we sung it today and we're gonna sing it at the very end. And it's a chance to take that relationship deeper. The beauty of Jesus and relationship with Jesus, I'm like t- almost 20 years in now and, and one of the amazing things about Jesus is that once you feel like, okay, I've got him figured out, he just blows your mind all over again, over and over and over and you're learning new things or the same things in deeper ways. You're like, oh my goodness, I thought he was incredible five years ago, but now I'm like, I had no clue. And he just keeps getting better and better and better and better. Amen. All right, I'm gonna close with this story and stop spitting all over y'all. Apologize in the front row, the splash zone. We're gonna close out in a, in a cl- chorus of worship and, and I hope we would be singing from not just lyrics on the screen, but a heart posture of, of deep intention. I was reminded this week of a story of a wealthy business guy. He had one son his wife had passed during childbirth, and, and this, this boy meant everything to this man. He loved his son. He, he set up his company. He worked so hard. He built out the trust. He got everything going, all for the purpose of someday, I'm going to pass this along to my son, and it's going to be amazing. And, and they had a great relationship, and everything was trending well. And then in a moment of tragedy, his son passed away, and the father was crushed. He threw himself into his work. He became a recluse, little to no relationship with outsiders, distant sort of apparition to most of his coworkers. And, and as can tend to be the case, he passed away in sort of a tragic place of isolation. And, and when he passed, there was no heir that was known family member. And so they were gonna put all his stuff off to auction. And so on this day, all of these people came in. He was a, a renowned art collector in his recluse. He would get pieces of art and that's where he would kind of connect with the broader world. And, and so he had all these amazing pieces of artwork and, and all these, he had cars, he had stuff. I mean, this guy was a wealthy, successful businessman. And so everyone's there kind of ready to get themselves a good deal as estate sales go. And so they're there and they're excited and the auctioneer gets ready. He's like, okay, first item up, and they're writing, like, first item up for sale is this painting. And it was a painting that the man did of his son, like amateur artwork. <laughs> He's like, all right, we're going to start the bidding at $3,000. Who wants $3,000? Who's the $3,000? You know, they do the fast thing. And he's trying to like make it happen and nobody wants the painting. <laughs> Guy in the back is like, get to the good stuff. You know, there's always that guy. And so he's like, oh. and so he finally, he keeps dropping it down. And finally, just out of pity, somebody in the back of the room goes, I'll take it for $100. And they turn around and it's the caretaker for the house. He didn't have a lot of money, but you know, he, he got the sentimentality of it all. And he's like, I'll take it for a hundred dollars. And, and the room does a collective sigh, like, oh, thank God, okay. And so they're, they're ready to go on to the good stuff. And the auctioneer looks around, he slams down his gavel. <laughs> Auction is over, everybody can go home. And the room erupts. And people are like, what are you talking about? We're, I mean, they're waiting for this priceless artwork, these amazing artifacts, these incredible cars, all this amazing stuff. They're like, what are you talking about? And the auctioneer, in an effort to squelch a, a budding riot, gets back on the mic. He says, I have here the will and wishes of the deceased, and this is what it says. Whoever gets the sun gets everything. And 
And listen, I know most of us listening are Americans. Guyana, y'all can maybe relate. And I get the thought of Jesus saying, here's eternal life. I paid for it with my own blood. It's me for all eternity. Sounds like a crazy ROI proposal. But I'm telling you, whoever gets the son gets everything. Every desire of your heart is found in him. Every longing that you've been trying to fill other places is found in him. Every single thing that you've been hoping and looking and searching and desperate to find, it's all found in Jesus. The moral of the story and why heaven is so glorious is because when you get there and you see him face to face, you fully understand what you've hoped and, and partially known that whoever gets the son gets everything. And this week I'm like, Jesus, you're so good, it's true, it's true. It's not just some words on a page. It's the truth of my life and it's the truth of your lives. Many of us in this room, whoever gets Jesus, man, you get everything, which means he's worth everything. I'm like, Jesus, I give you my money, it's yours anyways, take it. Jesus, you got my time, everything I have is yours. I'll inconvenience myself for your glory and your goodness and your grace and my prayers at the end of the day, if people on earth look and say, man, John Lash, so much potential, what a waste. He wasted himself for this Jesus thing that all of heaven would be looking down saying, man, what an investment and what a love. And when it comes to the afterlife, friends, it's not just about some contractual obligation and a return on your earthly investment. It's about Jesus, the lover of your soul, and a reunion that could happen that could be so glorious. Can I plead with you? Invest yourself in it now. Because whoever gets a son gets everything. Join me as we pray. Jesus, you're so good. I've done my best to articulate with all the strength in my voice and the passion in my heart just how good you are. Lord, would you go so far beyond anything that I could do by your spirit to remind us that we were created for relationship. And at the most fundamental level, we were created for relationship with you and it starts right now. Lord, call us back to first love. Call us back to abiding. Call us back to spending deep, significant, meaningful time with you that transforms every other facet of our lives. Because you're everything. If you're here this morning, my call is one and the same. I'm praying that you would be compelled by the Spirit of God in your heart to go deeper. Maybe you're here and you have no relationship or a very distant relationship with God. He has a distant ideal philosophy and religion. He's more than that. And you're invited this morning to enter into genuine, deep, meaningful relationship with God through Jesus, the only way it happens. You said, John, how do I start that? You ask. God, I've been a mess and I made a lot of mistakes, but if you'll still take me, I'm yours. Jesus, forgive me. I wanna follow you. Maybe you're here and at one point relationship with Jesus was the priority in your life, but it has dropped down the totem pole as life has got increasingly busy and full. And by God's spirit, you sense the conviction to put God back in his rightful place. I'd encourage you to do so. He has good plans for your life and he loves you. And he's the only one worthy to direct the script of your life in the way it was intended. 